Nice. Seen more like you're gonna have to be here. Um, oh, Fred, Fred knows. I actually turn that gizmo on, Fred. Okay. Okay, so I'll 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 do a, a little bit of a sound check here. Uh, I can hear a bit of an echo here. Are people on Zoom hearing it? Uh, I'm clear here. Am I clear for Zoom or not? Don't want to get halfway through and find it. it didn't I work. think the answer is yes. You are clear. Yes, for yes you are clear, Morley. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right, well, I'll start tonight by uh, talking about uh, actually how I started really getting into archaeology uh, and paddling uh, when I was uh, very young, when I was a preschooler in the first, first years of uh, elementary school. Uh, my family didn't have a lot of money. My dad was going back to normal school to become a teacher as part of a midlife crisis, uh, changing jobs. And uh, about the only place we could afford to go at that was uh, to go and camp on people's friends who, who were uh, uh, party members that my parents knew that had land on Pender Island uh, down by Gallup Point. And uh, we went there every year for quite a number of years. And um, I spent many formative years on this. Uh, I stopped by here uh, on our uh, and uh, this was the first time I'd been back to this beach uh, so this was you know you'd get to that at pretty much any time. sorry I hate to interrupt I'm so sorry I'm kind of the bossy person here um Whenever you look to the right, your voice cuts out completely. And so it's like you're you're talking like this and then you go, yeah, and then and then you come back and you come back and then I, you know, so if you can just look look to your um what is that, right? No, your left. Sorry. Turn your head the other way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, unlike the other one they were using earlier. Right there is good. Well, I'm, I'm happy with this one. Huh? Um, okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll I'll keep going. I'll stand this way. I'm not turning it much. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this was featured in the And uh, one of the things we did was when uh, there was always kids around, we build rafts for various people. And uh, they always had to be kind of like the as a kid, and uh, the, oops, the uh, wind chips had uh, property up on the block here, and uh, they had a really cool thing. It was a carving of a face, and um, uh, 
uh, a face and some uh, tally marks in, in, a, in a old growth Douglas fir, been there for hundreds of years. So, and this was the actual hidden where uh, where I started sticking it point and was very excited about that. And, uh, it's pretty cool. Looking uh, out towards Scallon Point, I was uh, on one of these rocks uh, down here, or maybe it was these ones, I'm not sure, when I was years old, and a pot of orchids came down. Looking down on the water, and it was this massive thing. And uh, I ran very quickly uh, all the way around the house and was. Uh, at that time, killer whales were thought to be killers. So, uh, so a few years later, we moved to Kamloops and uh, started excavation with a uh, best friend, uh, became uh, Mike Blake, who recently retired. He's now professor emeritus uh, at UBC, and uh, this was an excavation in a, a First Nations house pit uh, in the interior. And we did. Uh, Local Museum Association and uh, oh, of our work there. Oh, now to Victoria, I'm going to start out west. Uh, and uh, this is. Uh, sorry, uh, Maury, we, we need to do. Sorry, Maury, we need to do a. Uh, to us, uh, your sound test. You keep, you know, just you keep looking at the screen. Then, then talk. Probably we can hear you clearly. You know, you, yeah, yeah. You just don't turn around. Just keep your face to the uh, screen when you're talking. Then we can hear you clearly. Okay, I'll I'll just look at the screen on the computer then. Yes. Um, so this shows all the uh, archaeological sites uh, in in the area. Yeah, um, of, of the area. And um, uh, yeah, as you can see, the sites are all, almost continuous in some areas, like inside the inlet. On some of the uh, more rugged areas, uh, they're, they're a bit more uh, spaced out. But um, let's talk about some of the types of archaeology along the coast. So we have shipwrecks and things called reef net stations, which I don't think a lot of people know about. So that's, uh, that's of some interest. And uh, culturally modified trees, shell middens, uh, what are, we call wet sites, often associated with, wet, with shell middens, uh, defensive trench embankments, and burial cairns and mounds. Uh, so the reef netting is something that uh, was uh, with the, basically the people that spoke the Straits Salish language. So the Lekwungen people of Greater Victoria, the Saanich people, and the, uh, uh, the Kalalam across the uh, other side of the strait. And none of those people had access to really good fish runs apart from uh, some uh, uh, at the head of the Saanich Inlet. But uh, there was these massive runs that were on their way to the Fraser River in particular uh, that would come along the shore here. And uh, they eventually figured out a way to intercept them and uh, harvest them in large numbers with this, what are called reef nets. So the reef net was part net uh, up between two canoes, always used two canoes with it, and uh, a, a sort of a leader system. And uh, the way it worked was uh, they did it over, over reefs in relatively shallow water and relatively high current speeds. And uh, they tied, you can see someone's uh, drawn in the, the grasses here on the cross pieces. And the salmon apparently they're, they would be free to swim underneath this thing and go underneath all the nets, but uh, they apparently quite like to go into shallows uh, and they can drop predators. So if sea lions are chasing them or orcas are chasing them, uh, they, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll go to these shallows. They, they like the shallows because uh, they, they can get away from these things. And of course that will lead them in this case right into the net. And they have people at the, at the uh, stern end um, of the canoes watching to see if there's a school of salmon uh, entering the net. Uh, drawing by uh, Hillary Stewart, um, late Hillary Stewart, uh, she notes there's a, 
net of willow bark twine, uh, that would have been, because this is a relatively large net, uh, would have been very expensive and difficult to make uh, in, in the early time before people had access to, to uh, manufactured twines. And you have these big anchor systems uh, off the ends of the net and also to uh, hold the canoes in place and uh, additional weights on, on the net itself and things. Um, those anchors are really heavy. They're each, each boulder can weigh up to one or, or even I think two tons. And uh, they were placed there uh, as part of the gear by uh, going to an intertidal area beach uh, where there were boulders that had eroded out or whatever. And uh, people sort of strapped them with heavy cords around them uh, and then brought in a canoe as the tide was rising uh, attached the rope system to a heavy plank in between the two canoes, then just wait for the, the tide to lift them enough, and then they could paddle out to where the, uh, they needed to be placed and uh, slide them down an existing line to, uh, to form these big clusters so that they could have several tons of anchor holding them in place. So here's a, here's a view of them, the last ones that were still operating in the 1950s uh, in American waters. And you can see the two, they, these are uh, built boats by this time, they weren't, uh, they weren't using the canoes and the, uh, the leader systems uh, that, that drew the, the salmon into the net. And uh, another one, uh, this is older, this is about the 1890s and uh, the canoes after the, uh, could see the fish going in, they uh, released some lines and the canoes would drift in close together and they'd sort of brail the net up and, uh, uh, and then get the, the fish from the outside. Uh, you can see people are wearing some ceremonial regalia uh, at this time while, while they're doing it. And of course, these are the uh, West Coast style uh, big, big canoes they're using. Uh, where this was done was, uh, uh, you can see the map here. And we have a number of sites out west uh, in, in the Souk area and a whole bunch. And of course, those were the, uh, um, the, the Beecher Bay people. And the uh, Lekwungen uh, are mostly on the west side of um, uh, San Juan Island here and some of the other American islets. And of course, the, uh, the Klallam people from the, the southern state side uh, were, were a bit further over on some of the back islands. And a lot of the Saanich people were on uh, the penders here. And at, uh, there was a number of different groups went to Point Roberts, which was a, a really good spot uh, for it as well. And uh, this is the archeology span with them. They're, these are not sites you can see, um, but uh, it's kind of neat to know you're paddling over the top of them. And there's a diver in the picture here and these clusters of very large boulders that uh, are sitting on the seafloor in relatively shallow water. I don't know if you ever went out on a zero tide, uh, you might be able to see some of these uh, from, from the surface, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, these have been uh, mapped in the Souk area um, by some of the nautical archeologists, uh, mostly working for uh, Golder Associates. And I, I believe they did this on their own time, uh, uh, this work, but these red areas are areas where there's clustered um, uh, big boulders from these uh, anchors. And uh, this is near the, uh, the, the Bedford Island system here. And up by Smythe Head, uh, which coming, is coming out of Beecher Bay there, um, there's another whole set of them uh, in, in this area on the reefs, just, just a little ways offshore there. So kind of a, kind of a neat uh, thing that um, not many people know about, but <clears throat> Of course, this is going to be an important thing for uh, the First Nations saying, well, this is our, our continuing um, tradition of, of harvesting fish. And uh, uh, the Douglas treaties uh, protect that, etc. So they're, they're quite important in, in a modern setting as well. I suspect related to those, uh, um, those reef net stations is the petroglyph at Aldridge Point. Um, this is being described, I think, as a sea monster and various things, but I'm pretty sure this is a, a swimming sea lion, has the uh, kind of the wrinkles of fat in the neck and the, the sort of the mobile neck that sea lions have. Um, and uh, people use petroglyphs as part of their 
uh, ritual and magic system to encourage the fish to come in, uh, you know, at the, at the right time and the right place and this kind of thing. Um, I'll move on to culturally modified trees. Uh, Douglas fir bark harvesting is something that uh, most mostly we talk about cedar trees when we're talking about culturally modified trees, but on the south coast near Victoria, you also get Douglas fir. And uh, you can see from some of the, the, the numbers here that the uh, the Douglas fir, the, the wood is good and the bark is even better for burning. Um, it says moderate smoke here. My understanding and my experience with it is the Douglas fir bark, if it's uh, even a little bit dry, uh, has no smoke. And that, that was a big advantage uh, for people. Um, excellent, makes excellent coals. Uh, doesn't throw sparks. There's a whole bunch of uh, good reasons to, to like Doug fir bark. And it has very high heat uh, uh, levels that it gives off. So how uh, how does that how are they how was it used by First Nations? Um, this is a, a Paul Kane painting from his uh, trip in the 1840s through the Pacific Northwest in in this region. Uh, this one's down by Mount Hood. Actually, I saw a, a ground view, uh, and Mount Hood actually almost looks like that from uh, the right direction. And it shows uh, what's called a mat lodge. It's the equivalent of a, a teepee. It's a summer portable camping uh, type structure. And it's covered rather than covered with hides or, or uh, planks, it's covered with woven mats made from, uh, made from the Thule uh, bulrush type uh, plants. And leaning up against it is these odd shaped, long kind of skinny, uh, big chunks of something here. And I think there's some others on this side. And um, uh, uh, Darcy Matthews, another archeologist uh, that is at UVic now and used, used to work with me. Um, uh, he's pretty sure that these are, are Douglas fir and I think he's right about that. Uh, this is what one of the Douglas fir trees looks like after it's been stripped. Uh, Douglas fir is a bit different from um, uh, from cedar in the cedar CMTs, when the bark's gone, that part of the tree dies. The, the Douglas fir keeps living uh, even when the bark's taken off. And you can see that the big, deep, furrowed, ancient bark that's hundreds of years old, it's up a bit higher here, and how smooth it is down below. And uh, uh, this is another of Darcy's pictures. He's got a, a one and a two showing two different episodes of harvesting, they, they took one here and then they cut deeper into it uh, another time in here. And all the arrows are where there's tool marks, where there's wedge marks. Uh, people were using uh, antler wedges and hammering them with uh, stone hammers and driving them into uh, to split the bark off. And collecting fuel was a major part of uh, people's lives uh, going out and, and harvesting. And the dung fur is kind of a renewable thing. You can uh, do it and come back a hundred years later and you'll, you'll have more thick bark to take off. Another one here, just showing a close up of some of the tool marks and you can kind of see the edges of the wedge uh, that, that was driven in here. And there's another one in here and you can see all the different sort of layers of bark that have been uh, chiseled off through time. Um, this is uh, one of the sites uh, on Beecher Bay. Um, that we recorded back in uh, what was that our reports 2004 and each of the little red crosses here is a is a douglas fir modified uh, tree and you can see a lot of them are right on the shoreline here and i know when we've done paddling trips uh, out of beecher bay um, you can see a lot of these trees and it used to be you could see our yellow cmt flagging on them but uh, i think that's pretty much gone now but if you look you'll you'll see those smooth patches on the bark where the where the bark was taken off uh, move on to burial cairns. Um, burial cairns are, are grave sites with uh, large rocks marking the, the grave site. Uh, this is what they, they look like sort of typically now. Uh, a lot of brush around here and uh, overgrown with moss. A little bit hard to see. Uh, if you clean all the moss off, as again Darcy uh, did for both his MA and then his PhD, um, this is out at Rocky Point, so a little bit further around the corner than, than the last ones. Um, here's some uh, modern pictures of the, the, the cairns, so they're easy to see again with the bark cleaned off. And you can see this one has structure. It's more or less a square base and sort of pyramidal um, shape to it. 
um, quite quite obvious to see. And there's quite a range of variation uh, on on different sort of styles and types. Uh, this one a lot a lot of big boulders piled together. Uh, this one has a cairn on the outside, and it's got a, a a ring of about five by seven meter size, quite a good size uh, kind of ring of stones around the outside. And uh, Darcy, as part of his uh, graduate work, uh, uh, shot in with uh, a GPS or a, a total station. I can't remember what he used out here, but he he mapped in all the burial cairns uh, in Rocky Point on on the Department of Defense land, which, unlike most areas of Greater Victoria, hasn't been uh, the ground hasn't been disturbed much out there. It's almost like it was in in pre-contact time. Uh, and so you can see there's there's hundreds of dots over the landscape. They tend to be on uh, uh, on the flats in between the low lying areas that uh, um, anyway, they, they, there was probably camas beds all through here as well. Uh, there's also uh, cairns out by race rocks. And I think some of these you could actually see from a paddle and certainly if you get permission to land uh, and uh, have a little tour of the lighthouse sometime. Uh, you, you'll be able to look for these and, and see them. Uh, here's quite a big one here. Uh, you can see it's all kind of a rectangle with a filled in center to it. Uh, another thing we get here, uh, which will, most people don't know about, even if they know about the cairns, is burial mounds, mounds and ditch features. So this is one at Perry Bay, right, uh, right kind of where, the, very close to the T-junction, one, one way to Rocky Point and the other way to Beecher. Uh, and this is a mound, it's about 18 meters from the edge of the ditch here to the edge of the ditch on the other side. So quite, quite sizable. And the mound itself is uh, nearly a couple of meters high, I believe. And it has this ditch around the outside. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at LIDAR data, which is now publicly available through the BC government uh, uh, sites and a little bit of processing, and you can get an image of what ground looks like if there was no trees or vegetation there. So this here is that same feature. And you can quite clearly see the, uh, the mound with, it, with the ditch around it. And uh, there's another good size one here. Uh, there's also a number of, uh, I know that these ones are, are little, just little pimples kind of on the ground, but those are, those are cairns. Uh, I thought these might be cairns here too, until I realized, oh, wait a minute, you can see a little white ring around it. Uh, I bet you those are ditch features around these ones as well. So probably those are all mound features. Anyway, kind of neat. Another thing you see going around Albert Head, uh, a little bit closer into town yet, is uh, you're paddling over the top of the Albert Head wreck. I'm not sure exactly where this is. Um, it turns out it's not mapped on the, 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 the government website. Um, photo by, by Charles Moore, who's one of the underwater archeologists of Victoria. But pretty cool. You can see the uh, ship sitting on the bottom. Uh, it has uh, the, the hull outlined in here. Uh, you can see a couple of rectangular hatches in, in, in the center of it. Uh, because it's side scan sonar, the sound waves that, that make this picture are, are broadcast sideways and reflected a little bit sideways. So it leaves a shadow uh, on the side of the, the hull. And you can see the, uh, the overall hull shape here. It's kind of stretched out as if you were looking from the west. And you can see there, there's a bit of a mast left there. And you can see holes where it's starting to rot away and fall apart. And the sound waves are traveling through those spaces to, to make these kind of holes in the shadow. So kind of neat. Uh, trench embankments. Um, warfare has been always part of uh, Northwest Coast uh, culture. Uh, Kennewick Man, who's uh, from the Columbia River, about 9,000 years old, a uh, little bit older than when I found it's uh, a couple of hundred years younger than that, that I, I found near Kamloops when I was young, um, which is the oldest Canadian burial. Uh, but he was found with a projectile point embedded in the bones of his uh, pelvic uh, girdle. So met a, probably a, a painful end. Uh, and that's 9,000 years ago. So some archeologists think that warfare increased with a bow and arrow when it came into use about 1500 years ago in this area. And definitely warfare increased about a thousand years ago uh, all over the Northwest coast, because at that time you get a huge increase in the number of fort sites uh, all up and down the coast. So trench embankments, 
our fortifications, they've got a ditch and a steep rampart that often has a palisade over the top. Uh, usually they're across the neck of land to a little peninsula uh, that has steep sides, easy to defend, you know, against people trying to rush up the, the bank. Um, they're usually a temporary refuge. They're not something that you build a permanent village inside, although that was done in a, in a couple of cases. Uh, really hard to get a good picture or drawing of one. This is one I stole from a, an article by Grant Ketty and the BC Museums, uh, um, the, the Provincial Museums uh, website. And this shows the, uh, the, the, the ditch dug across the, the neck of land with a rampart on the inside going part way around until it meets the cliffs and then uh, a couple of houses uh, built inside. So uh, where's a, some good examples of this and ones that you'll see paddling. Taylor Road Beach is a really good example. You can go down Taylor Road, park at the end. A lot of people launch there if they're doing small trips because of uh, there's not a lot of parking there. You can't get a, a, a big trip, but you can fit half a dozen cars in there if you need to. Um, so it is, a, it is used as a launch place for our trips. Well, right beside there, just up in here, is this trench embankment. And this is, again, the LIDAR data. This is uh, taken from the aircraft uh, with scanning device that looks down and strips away the vegetation. And you can quite clearly see this big ditch feature that runs around uh, three sides of it. And, and there's the, the cliff on this side. So this one is, isn't on a peninsula, this is just built on a straight bit, bit of shoreline. Uh, and there's various mounds and lumps in here that are probably shell mitten mounds. Uh, this one's interesting because you might say, well, maybe it was the uh, farmers did that, you know, for some reason back in, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, but in this case, we have writings from 1857 from the very first settler, the first non-Hudson Bay Company uh, person that was an Aboriginal ancestry to, to live on the land there. And uh, he described it as this ancient encampment, and he has these old words for uh, defensive sites, aggers and ballums for the ramparts and the ditch or fossa. And he said the, the, the mound part is kind of worn down, but the uh, fossa, the ditch, is clearly discernible 12 feet in depth and 15 in breadth. And is an oval form, oops, that's supposed to be form, not from, uh, round three sides. The fourth side is occupied by a steep clay cliff on the sea beach. And you're, yeah, that's a pretty good description of this. And then uh, Martha Douglas, uh, Governor James Douglas's uh, young daughter, uh, wrote in her in her um, diary about riding over the property and visiting old Indian fortifications. There's actually a couple of them near there, so we're not exactly sure which one she looked at, but probably this one. Um, and asking Indians about the origin, they all say it was made by old people who inhabited the country before them. They know nothing more about it. Well, that's kind of colonial myth making uh, as, as it really started off because probably there's probably a language barrier and probably what they were saying, well, it's our ancestors who are no longer with us that made these things. So a little bit uh, interesting there. Uh, moving on further into Victoria, uh, getting closer. Uh, uh, Tower Point going into Whitty's Lagoon. There's a very nice uh, trench embankment feature here and some cairns in behind it. Uh, there's also a big long shell midden right down the spit. And uh, there's also another site I'll talk about in a minute that's, that's further in. Um, here's kind of zooming in to, to uh, Tower Point. And I believe the ditch runs roughly across this area here. And it's obscured by the by the trees here. Uh, this is the archaeologist's map of it. This is kind of the edge of the bluff. Uh, there's a bit of a, a trail in here. And um, this is the angle of this kind of curving ditch line. And the trench runs into a, a natural gully on, on this side. There's also burial cairns just in behind here. And uh, there's there's various trails come uh, went, went along the shore. Uh, oops. If there's a nice landing beach that's, uh, I can't remember if it's this one, but on the right tide height, at least, it's pretty good landing. So can be a bit of a scramble getting up, but there's washrooms right in here. So those are always good to know for paddlers. Uh, one of the rock washrooms has a, has a burial cairn uh, right beside it that they only found when they started to work on, on the, the washroom. And 
this was back 10, 15 years ago, and a archaeologist was there to, to monitor the work and stop them doing any damage to it. So it was it was left. Uh, you'll you'll see these cairns too if you walk around in there. Uh, I think this is taken there. I'm not 100% sure. And I couldn't find the ones that we took during a, 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 a Cisco paddle there that I, that I led once. And I, I know there was a good picture of the, the trench. But uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see it as a distinct dip in the ground. And you, uh, we, I know on our Cisco trip, we, several of us followed it uh, right, right around through the bush. Um, this is the peninsula, uh, the spit that, that cuts off Woody's Lagoon. Uh, it's all thin shell midden, but shell midden all the way down. It gets a bit thicker at the end. Um, this map is from uh, 1989, I think it might say, or 79, I can't remember, something like that. Uh, it's, it says dark, silty sand with shell at the end. That's the, the shell midden it's made out. There's also a little circle here, and it says C for Cairn. So if you're out there, it's very near the end of the, the spit. And uh, interestingly, I brought up the LIDAR uh, data and here's the end of the spit and uh, there's the cairn shows up pops up as a nice little circle on on the on the the uh, the data there so it's, it's still there and interesting looking at it this is uh, we exaggerated the the vertical on this to make the shadows stand out a bit more so it looks kind of rougher than than it is but i'm intrigued by all these kind of rectangular shapes that are that are out there and i bet you there's house uh there, there was old houses sitting where those rectangular shapes are. It's all overgrown with gorse and, and broom and stuff now, but uh, next time we're off for a lunch, I, I'll probably go down there and poke around and see if I can see any, any, any vestige of these, uh, these rectangular shapes. Uh, as you go into Witty's Lagoon, um, there's another couple of shell middens. This is the turn just before you go up to Lady Falls. And uh, on the outside part of that turn, uh, right by the little creek that comes in, uh, there's a shell midden with a, a house depression uh, that's right in there. And the archaeologists that dug this, the uh, north arrow is uh, off on a funny angle. So anyway, it mat matches the other one. But they, they did a, a, an excavation unit uh, as part of a parks project in here. But, uh, but this, um, uh, this depression from the house should be visible as well. Uh, so talking about shell middens, the shell middens are layers of shell and uh, ash, you can see the orange color here is ash, a uh, very rich soil with lots of charcoal in it, lots of humus, um, probably from food stuffs that rotted away. Uh, it's kind of a com combination compost and whatever. And uh, shell is uh, forming large parts of it. Uh, and of course, shell was not a very high uh, status food. Uh, people were on the West Coast, at least, were, were teased when they had to eat it. Uh, as opposed to like they really wanted to eat whale blubber is the, the much much preferred food, um, but uh, shell is what got you by when the times were were a little bit thin. So, uh, and uh, of course, a nice smoked clam. There's nothing wrong with that for uh, for for good tasting food. Um, so you, you get a lot of shell and obviously in the shell middens. Um, here's one where we excavated, moving closer into town again, uh, Squamalt Lagoon. At the end of the spit there, uh, we did some work uh, when one of my staff was driving into town when she lived from in Machosen and stopped to look at, give the dog a run or something and, and uh, have a look at uh, the construction was going on and found, oh, that looks like fire broken rock and there's wood bits in there. And so I went down with her and like, yeah, that's, uh, that's wet site. So we, uh, uh, we arranged to, to excavate as they were doing their construction and um, had, had a good look at part of the site there. And uh, you can see a, a, a very nice uh, hearth here with a perfect circle of stones and it's all infilled with, with ash. Um, we're actually recovering a basket at the bottom here in, in uh, wet site uh, uh, saturated deposits. And one of the artifacts we got from there was this miniature whalebone club. It's only, you know, perhaps uh, seven centimeters long or something like that. People might think, oh, it's probably a child's toy. But uh, clubs were uh, named. They had their own names. Uh, they were considered to have their own spirit power. Uh, they're probably not something it would be appropriate toy for a child. They played with bows and arrows, but, uh, but probably not with... Uh, 
these particularly shaped clubs, but what, who did use miniature ones were the shamans. And they used them in fights with other shamans when there was warfare or in, in competitions and things. They, they were kind of ritually used in, in, uh, in, their own, uh, in their own work. So that's probably what, what that uh, The other thing there is uh, basketry. Uh, this piece was, came out of the, the spoil of the excavation that, that had already gone and it's pretty torn up. But even that, you can see there's a little bit of intact weaving in here. And that's enough to show that, oh, this is uh, what's called wraparound wrap uh, plating or uh, plated wrapped twining. There's a couple of different names for it. But it's basically your checkerboard over, under, over, under both ways um, with an additional strengthening wrap around it there. And it's very, very characteristic of this 3000 year old period. Um, here's just some, some other artifacts that, that we found at that site. Uh, some stone spear points here, uh, stone abrader or grinding stone, uh, some chip stone projectile points, a knife and some bone tools, a needle here with an eye, uh, a couple of beads, uh, a fishing spear with uh, little barbs on the edge and uh, uh, some other uh, bone tools. Uh, the other thing you'll, you can see here, both on a paddle or, or if you're walking, is if the tide's a bit low, you will see some wood stakes sticking up. This is very close to those pictures of looking down in the construction trench, um, of course, which is up underneath the road. Uh, and this is probably the same age. This is probably kind of what some of the, the bottom over there was looking at. But there's uh, stakes have been driven in, whether they were part of uh, racks of some kind or uh, stakes to hold canoes from drifting away or um, uh, small um, kind of uh, ramps or jetties, those kinds of things. But there's a number up here. I think we got red flagging on other ones. But if you go down there, you'll see wood sticking out. And it's, uh, it's about 3,000 years old in all probability, at least the, the ones we dated from under the road were. And this is probably the same age. It's about the same level. Uh, quite quite uh, fun. Uh, some other things. This is uh, one of our competitors uh, that um, uh, excavated uh, site that's in that sort of failed development that's behind the lagoon at uh, the Squamalt Lagoon. And uh, they, they found some very interesting, uh, about again around 3,000 year old uh, small underground houses. And also these really neat uh, uh, hearths made out of lined with cobbles and stacked up several courses high uh, in this kind of big, almost sort of oven, oven fire combination. And uh, as they, they excavated them down, they, they sort of took it apart and went deeper. And uh, this is the, the bottom layer of rock in there. And then they found that there was another one that had existed right beside it. And you can see it's slightly underneath one, this one, slightly set to the side and had most of the rock had been scavenged to uh, to build the new one, but there were still a few left in, in, in place around the circle. So yeah, pretty, pretty neat features that, that can be found. Uh, coming in a bit further, Fleming Beach. I think everybody's probably paddled out of there at one time or another, if you've been on the water for a few years at least. Uh, now, of course, there's the big uh, fisherman's uh, club uh, ramp and that, but at the other end of the beach here, there's actually uh, trench embankments at both sides of the beach. Uh, this one, this photo taken about 1960, you can see the uh, line of bushes here running in a deep trench that cut off this part of the peninsula. Obviously they, this, this bit of rock and steep was sufficient or thought sufficient to, uh, to, to, to uh, fortify this area once they cut off the easy access from the back. Uh, this is a photo taken, I think, in the 1890s of that ditch feature uh, and, and looking across at it. So uh, in the background here, you can see the, the rocks that are now the climbing wall. A lot of people go out and sport climb and, and boulder on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the back here. And uh, this is a big, deep, deep midden. It's almost all gone now. Most of it was taken away, um, partly as a uh, result of enlarging the uh, the, the ramp that used to be down there. It was a, a small boat launch, uh, and now it's quite a big boat launch. So these, these archaeological sites disappear, you know, through time. Um, moving in Holland Point, not something you'll see paddling, but uh, everybody's probably walked down here, so I thought we'd, we'd include it. 
Um, the red is the uh, the archaeological site as as recorded, but within that there's a there's a trench embankment, and when you take this the site away, you'll see that uh, there's uh, I I think the main feature is actually under this bush, but you can also see that there's a a, a feature running along here, and I know as you walk down this path, if you look for it, especially if you're there when the sun is low and casting shadows, you'll see you'll see the remains of this trench. And this this one cut off uh, this this part of Holland Point. Uh, moving around, uh, this is uh, getting up into Oak Bay, and uh, something I had never seen for myself was the stone bowls that I'd heard about, but never never seen. So yesterday, uh, I was at Oak Bay Bikes looking at a bike, and uh, had to wait for a while, and I came down, and uh, like oh there they are, I found them at the bottom end of Boker. And this is the first, uh, if you want to find these yourself, it's the first uh, rock outcrop as you come down the beach from the tea house and what have you. And uh, I put, uh, uh, I, I did a quick quick and dirty recording in our uh, software that's on our uh, on our phones to, uh, to record where these things were. And this is, there's the tea house in the blue there. And here's one of the bowls here on the bedrock. See, it's a, it's a nice oval shape. There's another one right in here. There's another one in the distance there, and there's there's uh, five of the larger ones, more or less in a line along here, and then there's another 20 small ones, which I didn't see any of the small ones myself, but I didn't spend uh, really any time looking. I um, uh, some, something to do another time, uh, but these, if if you feel with your finger on the inside, you'll feel how smooth the rock is because they were uh, they were pecked and and probably ground and polished a bit uh, to to make them smooth. These were used by uh, diviners, usually shamans, uh, maybe other people that wanted to practice magic. Um, apparently, you you looked into the reflection of of that was coming off the surface of these things because obviously they they stay full from the tide as it drops, and uh, uh, you could you could communicate with the spirit world if you had the right powers to 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 do that by uh, interacting with these. And they may have been out on this point very often. There were features, rocks and things that if you said particular spells and if you walked around them the right way or jumped over them or what have you, you could influence the weather too. And uh, you could, uh, you know, if it's blowing hard, you could perhaps uh, get some spiritual help to get the wind to drop so you could get over to Discovery Island if it's a bit choppy. So um, that's that. That's where those are. I think that's more photos here. Yeah. So here's one that's a little bit hard to see because because uh, uh, the seaweed's over it, but this one here is easier to see. And again, you'll see this one in the background there. Another one looking down. Uh, another one looking down and across across to Chatham and Discovery. And uh, my feet beside another one of these. So they're quite neat. Uh, and then coincidentally, yesterday, the day before yesterday, one of my staff uh, sent me a photo of one she had found at a site on. Uh, Gabriola Galliano, the one in the, the southern Gulf Islands, not the one up by Nanaimo. I never never get that right. Uh, and there was one one of these on the beach on a on a big boulder um, um, that, that was there. So it's kind of neat. Um, talk a little bit about uh, oh this one is uh, an excavation we did. This is getting around into uh, uh, Cadbury Bay at uh, thirty one twenty five Beach Drive or the Eagle Nest Estates. Uh, back uh, about 20 years ago, uh, Japanese uh, pharmaceutical uh, company owner spent a great deal of money refinishing the main house and doing this uh, very exotic uh, uh, multi-million dollar uh, landscaping project. You can see tool house, tea house and pool house and boat house sauna and the exercise room and the pool over here. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, I grabbed this image, kind of neat looking from the air down uh, from Google Earth. Uh, here's the, the main house. It's a heritage house, so it, the, the facade and that was protected. Uh, conservancy they built here. And here's the, uh, the pool house, uh, tea house in here, and the sort of underground uh, boathouse that's, that's here uh, giving access. We worked around where the boathouse was and around the, the original natural shoreline around in here. And uh, what we were finding were um, these features that were probably used in, in camas processing. 
So people harvesting camas in the background, uh, the bulbs and uh, camas was both a major staple in the diet locally, but was also traded all the way up to uh, uh, Nootka Sound and beyond up, up the outside coast. Uh, very, very highly valued and they, they trade it for um, uh, things like probably the whale blubber and the whale bone that came back the other way. Uh, but, uh, oops, yeah, you can see some of the blackened uh, soil in here and we, we were getting various patches and, and lots of fire broken rock from, from this. And also people were camping here. Most of the occupation here was uh, about 2,500 years ago. Uh, but it was also used at least sporadically right up to the historic time because we found a couple of glass trade beads in here as well. And some quite remarkable artifacts uh, showed a couple here. One of these is used on one of the uh, cairn, uh, cairn plaques that uh, the city developed. And uh, I can't remember the name of the woman that put them together, but uh, yeah, she got some images uh, of this one in particular. This is a, an antler tablet and it's carved to almost this, um, almost like a copper shape. And then it has these very clearly Northwest Coast design elements. It's got the, the ovoid eyes. It has uh, the, the crescentic shapes and um, the uh, ver various uh, other um, infilled uh, shapes in it. And all together, I think what it is, it's, it's two birds or bird masks that are kind of viewed from the side, but but then folded flat to, to the surface. Um, and uh, quite remarkable. From the same time period on Pender Island, there were some small, with the burials, there were some small uh, miniature uh, bone or antler masks uh, in 3D that, that were uh, recovered. So this, this might be part of that same uh, kind of ritual set of beliefs and, and, and things that this, this is, uh, representing, but quite, I think quite a remarkable art piece and, and hasn't um, really been described or talked about by the art historians, uh, someone that knows more than me about how, how art works, but uh, uh, it's pretty cool. And then uh, this is a librette. This, these were lip ornaments. Um, we found half of one and then used uh, um, mirroring and things to, to kind of make, make it back to what it would have looked like whole, kind of dished on the outside. They probably would have had that filled with uh, with uh, sticky material, with perhaps uh, inset, uh, uh, fine different colors and things uh, on the outside. And this is the part that went inside your mouth, uh, up against your teeth. You could actually, I don't know if we can see it on this photo, but you could actually see the in imprints of the, the person's teeth in it. Um, and these were, um, not used on the south coast for the last thousand years or more, um, but they persisted in the north coast. Um, and up there, women women were still using them on the north coast uh, up until the sea otter uh, trade, uh, the, the first uh, uh, Europeans that came to the coast. And uh, they were not very uh, uh, complimentary on how they made the women's faces look. Um, and uh, thought they were they were awful. I suspect now they'd be a lot more, uh, strangely, 250 years later, they'd probably be quite acceptable now that body piercing and, and small librettes and things are used now. But uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, things change and the same. And I'll just talk a little bit about all the uh, all the cairns that used to be through, particularly the uplands and uh, Cadbury Bay areas um, that are mostly no longer there. A couple of the parks have some. Uh, the Uplands was developed uh, in the early 1900s by the Olmsted brothers. They were famous landscape architects and developers from Boston area. Uh, their father had been the landscape architect that designed Central Park in New York. Uh, pretty good, pretty good uh, pedigree there. Uh, they also did uh, British properties in Vancouver as another sort of exotic thing, but they pioneered the use of sort of slightly winding uh, streets and uh, underground uh, servicing and wires uh, and making the place look really nice. One of the things that they did is that they, they saw all the burial cairns that were out there. Uh, they actually mapped them all. Um, and uh, it seemed like maybe they were planning to avoid them, but I'm not sure that actually happened. Uh, but this is some of the cairns uh, out. You can see the difference in vegetation uh, from 120 years ago and earlier. 
uh, there was not the brush layers, not the thick trees and, and shrubs. Uh, it was an open, more like an open savanna. Uh, this time it was probably affected by grazing quite a bit, but there would have been uh, short grasses and things and the oak trees widely spaced apart uh, all through this area, just kind of magical, especially in the spring and when the camas are growing. Uh, big, big camas growing uh, harvesting area for First Nations all through here. And the, uh, the 1840s Hudson Bay Company records uh, complained about all the, uh, the fires that were lit in the late summer and that there was just fires going all over. They almost lost their crops that they planted um, and it caused early conflict with the, the European settlers. And it was those fires kept this, uh, kept this as open savanna. So I've got a couple of photos here. This one's uh, uh, the surveyors that were laying out the uh, uh, laying out the subdivision and also recording the, the burial cairns. And in fact, they set up their survey instrument on top of one of the big cairns here. And this guy here with the uh, cowboy hat on, the Stetson, uh, is uh, Frank Swanell. And uh, it's funny because we we know him down here a little bit from here, but mostly we know him from our work up in north north central northeast BC in the Tseki Dene area uh, on Williston Lake and up in the Tudadi uh, Tudadi Lake area that uh, Lynn and I went up uh, to, to work on uh, a few years ago. And uh, we use his maps and his notes and we still see his cairns up on the mountains and uh, things like that. Uh, he was building his own cairns for triangulation surveys, but uh, um, yeah, pretty neat to like, oh, he's, he's part of uh, the, the Oak Bay story here. Uh, uh, another one of the Cairn here, another Cairn here, other ones in the distance and the, this really neat uh, open savanna kind of uh, territory picture here. And of course, a lot of these cairns were opened by the European settlers. Uh, the Victorian Edwardian Society thought it was educational or whatever, take the kids out for the weekend and uh, plunder some burial uh, cairns, open them up and look at the bones and, uh, you know, take any artifacts that, that were, were buried with the people. So uh, another shot here of uh, Natural History Society, probably in some ways uh, ancestral to the Siska, uh, in, in general as a historic natural history kind of uh, things, but out, you know, and doing things that would be just kind of unthinkable in, in uh, today's ethics. And another shot looking across. I think it's really neat. And this is how the parks uh, in Oak Bay should look. Uh, not not in these dense thickets that that cover the the areas now. Uh, so just to end, we'll pop out to the uh, Discovery Chatham, and uh, here on the Chatham, this is this is reserved. So unless you get special permission, you can't actually land and, and look at these ones. But you can at least know they're there paddling by. You can see Event Right Island is in here and Strong Tide Islet. Uh, so this is the northern tip of the chat or the eastern tip, sort of north. What is that? Maybe it's northwest on the Chathams. The, anyway, the, pretty much the northern tip there. And uh, I know that there's there's archaeological site recorded in this little neck of land where there's a nice beach on both sides. And uh, oh, we, we were looking at the LIDAR data the other day and like, oh, okay, well, you've just got a sort of a berm of, of the midden buildup on this side and also in there. And then, oh, wait a minute, there's some rectangular things here, though that's got to be houses. And then we looked up the uh, uh, looked at the detailed record for the site, and indeed it says there's uh, there's uh, remains of two house depressions that are about 10 meters back from the edge of the, the top of the beach. So it's like yeah, and you, you can see them on the on the lidar too. It's very neat. Um, here looking at Discovery Island, and I'll finish up here. Uh, we have a site I'll talk about down here in a minute. And a couple of shell middens that if you're camping out there or even on a day trip, you, you could walk over and have a look at. Um, so this is the area, the campground is uh, and our lunch spots just off to the right there. And uh, this is the trail that, that comes across and goes down to the point. I think that's the, uh, the sign out there right in here. And uh, these, uh, it's the, this, this bay in here. Uh, and the next one have, have a little shell midden at the top end that, that you can look at. Um, you can see it's kind of a built up 
ridge in here and on this next peach in here. And uh, back in here, there's deeper midden. There's also was a tree throw and there was human remains in the tree throw. So, you know, respect those and, and, and leave them alone if they're still visible e even uh, when you're there. Obviously don't collect anything, but uh, it's, a, it's a nice little side trip, uh, something different to go look at when, when you're over on the discoveries. Uh, the other thing to, again, that you can't see, but it's kind of neat to know it's there is when you're going around discovery and come around these last uh, point, uh, rocky uh, points, and there's the uh, green of the, the campground area, is uh, the Prussian bark Rosalia. Big, big ship, quite big at 280 tons. Its remains are down on the bottom, just off there. Uh, 20th March, 1868, she was lost uh, just about this time of year. Uh, a tug was towing two ships. They let them both go because there was too much wind. They couldn't handle them. Both of them uh, went ashore with their crews. I don't think there was any loss of life, but one hit the rocks in here, and then it must have drifted and, and ended up sinking over here. Um, it was her only voyage to BC. She was carrying lumber from Burrard Inlet, which would have been, a, I'm not sure that's even before Vancouver uh, actually started, but it's right at the very beginning there. Uh, but there was lumber mills, first of all, in Burrard Inlet, and she was carrying lumber from there uh, to Hawaii and uh, foundered, and she's now on the bottom, 200 meters uh, off uh, Seabird Point in Redland Bay. And uh, there's a, 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 a grommet from either a chisel or a, or a wooden wedge, uh, but wooden, uh, about 3,000 years old, and some cordage and a chipstone uh, artifact and a groundstone one that uh, uh, just happened to make a nice little face. And that's, that's the end of my, uh, end of my talk. Happy to answer any questions if anyone has any or uh, can go, yeah. Oh, on, on land. Uh, well, they've got a plank and waited for the tide. No, no, that was the, that was the anchors for the, for the, for the nets. Um, I think they're just, they're just small enough that you can use pry bars and fulcrum rocks and manage to roll them slowly to get them in place. But yeah, they're, they're pretty big and heavy. So. No, in this area, there's only about uh, 4,000, 4,500 years is the oldest sites in Greater Victoria have been found. Uh, now, we do find artifacts. None of them have been dated, but by cross-dating the style, I, I know that they're similar to ones that on the U.S. side are clearly dated at about eight or 9,000 years old. Uh, and we find those um, in, in basically places people were hunting um, all through the, uh, the, the Victoria area. Uh, there was a camp with a whole bunch of them up on top of um, uh, Skirt Mountain. Uh, what do they call it? And Bear Mountain. And uh, that's, uh, but they weren't able to get a good date from that. And uh, the reason that we don't have older sites is um, if you look at the bottom of and take samples at the bottom of Portage Inlet, uh, it was dry ground more than 4,000 years ago. And the sea level has come up and drowned a lot of the areas. So the old village sites are underwater. And uh, if someone is dredging those sites, Again, we're paddling. Yeah, there's, there's um, uh, bison were, were here for a while, uh, both on the Sandwich Peninsula and on the Gulf Islands and in US islands. And period when people lower um, when all the water and the global sea levels were lower and um, that's around 11,000 years ago 
um, there's suggestions that some of the bone is butchered and has cut marks and things. Uh, it's not slam dunk evidence, but uh, at some point there'll be good evidence for much older sites. And here we have the opposite problem. Uh, in here, most most of that levels way higher, and probably those sites have a different condition. Uh, and often don't get those kind of things. You know, it's just a small amount of um, um, and then this is people went from very high to very low, it was below uh, as much as 40 or 50 meters below modern sea level uh, by about uh, nine or 10,000 years ago. Okay, burial mounds typical. Yes, occasionally there's there's multiple. Um, oh, the, the grave, right. The question is would the burial mounds typically be a single grave? Uh, yes. Yeah, occasionally you get multiple burials or a family or something, um, but uh, mostly they're they're single. Uh, so would underground houses impoverished? Or... Neither, I think. The underground houses were uh, used mostly in the interior. Uh, Semi-underground houses, they, they sort of appear about 4,000 years ago there, and they're a little bit later maybe on the coast. They didn't really catch on on the coast, I suspect, because you got your basement flooding, but, uh, uh, you know, but uh, the thing is they're very warm. So if it's a, if it's a cold period, um, you've got all that earth insulation that, that helps, and you've got earth insulation on the roof as well. So, um, no, they're just a sort of a different style of house and, and, and it, it didn't last all that long. Although people, there was occasional ones, there was ones at Musqueam that were there until almost the, uh, uh, in, into the historic period or, or just before people remembered. Yeah. At, at Cap'n Point? Uh, yeah, I'm not aware of those ones, but uh, it's... Mm. There were, yeah, there was big commercial, yeah, there, there, Yeah, the, uh, the the Europeans quickly took over most of the places that were good for that and and made made it bigger and more more efficient and ended up of course that was some of the first hits on, on the uh, the numbers of salmon around uh, but they uh, they erected big weirs and also had these things called fish wheels that would turn with a current and scoop the fish up and then dump them where they just, I don't know, run right into the cannery or something. I'm not quite sure how that worked, but um, yeah, there was, I know there was commercial ones built and probably in places where the, the old traditional techniques wouldn't work, so yeah. Uh, well, the, when the DNA was, was done and fairly recently, it's, uh, it's clearly First Nations uh, links to, to the modern. There was initially some um, discussion that maybe some of the, the bone attributes looked partly European or ca Caucasoid, I think was the word used, which can mean kind of a whole bunch of things, not just Western European. Um, but uh, the, the DNA is, is uh, very distinctive of, um, of, I can't remember if it was the group that, yeah, I, I, I it's not my area of specialty, so I kind of read the news and <laughs> remember it for a little while and then forget the details. So, uh, but but I know it, it, the DNA did show it was uh, clear clear links to First Nations. Yeah. On the oh, the hey boards. Morley, can you repeat the question? For those of us who are watching online. 
Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the, the question is, is there any dating for the bulls that are on the beach uh, there? Um, no, although that, that place is called uh, Sichalnath in the, in the Sikwangan, uh, Likwangan language. And it means a place where there was a lot of driftwood buried in the sand. Uh, that site started the oldest deposit center at about 3,000 years old, and then it was uh, inhabited up to pretty much the contact period. So those bowls could date to any or all those times. And, and there's, there's nothing you can actually physically date on, on a stone bowl. Yeah. In this area, uh, what, oh, the question, yeah, the question is, what's the most exciting find uh, that I've made in, in this area? <laughs> then <laughs> you beat me to it. I was, I was about to say that, Lynn. <laughs> Um, archaeologically, uh, I don't know, there, there's, there's so much through time. I, in many ways, that the, the wet site at, uh, at the Esquimalt Lagoon and the material that came out of there, that, that was really neat. Uh, we just had a few days to recover that material, but uh, there, there was just so much information and it was just re really neat stuff. That, that was pretty neat. Um, Otherwise, it's yeah. I don't know. Some some of our um, uh, thoughts, like, like I, I was talking about the all the um, cross dating of the much older uh, projectile points that are found in in mostly higher elevation uh, throughout Greater Victoria, and kind of coming up with that realization that hey, these are old points. And uh, we looked at their distribution in terms of elevation and uh, they weren't skewed towards the coast at all. They were, if anything, skewed inland. And like, yeah, okay, well, this is the, the inland use of the landscape from that early time. And when there's no, uh, no dated evidence for that time at all, although we know people must have been here and must have had uh, villages and camps, and, uh, but they're, they're underwater and that's why we're not finding them. So that, that was, I don't know, to me, that's kind of exciting, but yeah. Uh, yeah, the question is, are there any limits on development on uh, uh, where, where there's significant archeological uh, remains and the the real answer to that is there's even limits on insignificant archaeological remains. Uh, there's things have to be taken quite carefully, even if uh, they're they're not particularly scientifically significant. Um, virtually all pre-contact material is protected by law, and uh, there's there's more and more pressure to uh, to follow that uh, to the letter of the law. Um, and so uh, we have too much work these days. We, we can't uh, deal with all the private uh, lots and developments that, that come up. So. Okay, the, the question is uh, on the bowls, the, the bedrock bowls, uh, how can you dis distinguish between natural, uh, natural bowls and, and smoothed out kettles and things that you get particularly in sandstone and, and these features? And uh, part, of, part of it is the, the, the hardness of the rock. Uh, the sandstone will uh, get a, a rock that can, especially where there's some surf, that rolls around and, and makes a nice, smooth, deep, uh, round uh, kind of kettle shape. Um, these ones are in areas that don't have that same wave action. Um, I mean, there is in winter storm, they're not that frequent. And uh, they're much harder rock. Um, and there's
and these ones are perfectly smooth and uh yeah it's just like yeah it's so only people could could really do that Uh, the question is uh, on the bedrock bowls, how do we know they're used by shamans? Uh, that's from oral histories and uh, what was recorded, you know, a uh, hundred years ago by the first ethnographers in the area. Um, they, they, uh, they used both those bedrock bowls and also what are called seated figure bowls. Uh, there's smaller boulders were carved into uh, uh, animals and human shapes. Uh, a lot of the older ones have uh, rattlesnakes that run up the back of the uh, the back and, and then the head sort of comes over the top and they have rattlesnake uh, rattles on, on the bottom shown. Uh, some of those are soapstone and of course the soapstone comes from the Fraser Canyon and those ones are probably carved up there and maybe that whole tradition uh, of the, the snake part of it being a rattlesnake because of course they don't occur on the coast uh, also must have come from there too but um, uh, we know that those ones were also filled with either oil uh, or water and and the uh, the kind of the shimmer you know looked at to uh, to, to see into the spirit world so that uh, um, we're just uh, making the uh, knowing uh, the people talked about some bowls used that way on the on the coast and these sort of more portable boulder ones uh, that were also uh, uh, carried around and we know those were all used that way that we're making the assumption that these ones are, are, are for that as well i don't think they were for processing acorns or other things that that people have suggested that acorns weren't really used for food here uh, they were other places of the same species, but but not here. Hey, Mori. Hey, Mori. There's a question. Uh, in the Zoom meeting, you know, there's a concept called uh, you know time you know time uh, travel. If you you know you are able to you know travel back to an Asian Asian you know time time of period. So which you know Asian time of period you would like to travel back to, and what's the reason? What in that you know Asian time of period interests you the most? That's the question. Uh, yeah, the question. Oh no, everybody, everybody can hear that one because <laughs> that came from the came from the ether. Um, what period would I like to travel back to? Uh, I think this Locarno period that about is around three thousand uh, years old is really interesting. That and the slightly older, about four to five thousand years old period, is really interesting because. Um, you get individuals and, and, and children that are buried sometimes with hundreds of thousands of stone beads or stone and shell beads, just an enormous level of effort to make that many beads and string them. Um, clearly wealth and status uh, and ascribed to children. So they're inheriting their high status from their parents and ancestors. Uh, and they're accumulating wealth and you get all these really interesting artifacts, things called the Gulf Islands complex and stuff. And there's evidence that, you know, the culture is getting quite complex, but they're still living in small houses, but there's some kind of complexity happening there. And then you get a bit later and that all disappears and it goes back to what appears to be people are more egalitarian. And then you don't get, uh, the rise of complexity like that again until uh, really into the, the, the later period, uh, the last couple of thousand years or 1500 years, you, you get evidence that, okay, the houses are getting bigger and people are living in bigger communities and uh, more, there's more complexity. So I think, I think that period would be really interesting to travel back in time to and see what's going on. But uh, uh, I, I wouldn't rate my chances of uh, surviving too long. Uh, <laughs> In this, not not being related to anybody back there, there then that would that was usually a, if you're related or could, you know suggest some re relationship, uh, uh, you're probably safe. But otherwise, you're kind of fair game as being a stranger and uh, an outlander. And uh, uh, yeah, 
I think it was it would have been a be a hazardous uh, outcome. Yeah, Fred. Yeah, the, the question is what what's likely the population of First Nations uh, pre-contact time in the uh, the CRD. Um, I'm not sure I can give a ex good estimate on that. Uh, the estimates that you hear all the time on the news and things, I think are generally really inflated. Uh, the, the first population estimates done by modern people looking at, at population history uh, were like Wilson Duff in, in uh, the early 60s or whatever. And they were looking at the uh, uh, the early population estimates uh, from uh, early census that were, were done by the Hudson Bay Company uh, and others. And they were kind of for all of BC coming up with maybe 80,000. Um, knowing that there was a history of European diseases coming into the Northwest coast and killing off a lot of people even before the first uh, Europeans got here, that sort of kind of opened the floodgates to, well, maybe there was twice that many. And now it's, you know, people are saying, oh, there was, you know, 50, 60,000 people in just this little kind of, you know, cove or something you know, now. And I, I don't think if you're living off the land, um, even if you're able to trade surpluses and things with other, other groups that um, it's, uh, you know, they, it, it was hard to make a living you know, and, and, and get by. And there, a lot of the warfare was over things like who owned salmon streams and things. Um, but in the, this area, uh, it was a very high population density compared to uh, uh, most areas where, where there was not full-fledged agriculture. Uh, it was, you know, probably in the few tens of thousands, I, I would think. Uh, getting over that, I, I don't know if it could support numbers much higher than that. Uh, and what the numbers are now, uh, I'm not sure. I think it's a, probably in the 5,000, because there's a lot. Um, it depends on being sure how far going on. So I, I don't have a really good answer for that. But I would think in, in, the few, in the few tens of thousands, which is still a lot of people, if you know, you're digging clams and hunting the migrating waterfowl, trying to get the numbers going by, it's, uh, it's still a pretty big number. Of course, you could do all, all kinds of things as well. But yeah, any? Yay. Or, if, if there are no more questions, um, I want to thank um, our speaker tonight for an incredibly interesting um, session. I certainly learned a lot. As usual, we're going to thank him with one of our wonderful mugs. But this guy's been our speaker so many times, he's probably got enough to open his own bar. So thank you very much. Oh, good Yeah. Um, I also have two for Jenny, so don't run out without talking to me, please, tonight. Okay. I also want to ask you, Jenny, um, do you have an update on the paddle for April for the people that are interested in bird watching? So for those of you in TV land, um, the answer was uh, look on the website shortly, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, anything else, any comments, anything? So thank you very much. Hope to, oh, last thing. Um, if anybody out there either watching or in the audience has um, suggestions for topics that they'd like to hear presented at our meetings, whether it's here or through Zoom land, um, please send an email to either Alan or I um, so we can add them onto our potential list. Um, thank you very much. Hope to see everybody at our next meeting, which as Alan has already mentioned, 
will be the AGM. One of the things we're going to do for the AGM is we'll probably be starting an hour early and we're going to have a gear grab. So we certainly have the space here and there's tons of tables. So if you want gear, if you want to swap your gear, if you want to bring it to sell it, if you're looking for gear, show up early. Thank you very much. Alan, do you have anything else? Good night. Drive safe.